the red flag flying here. Hello and welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today I'm here with John Trickett. Hello, John. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm absolutely fine, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Good, good. Um, so I'm going to go into the first question, the big question. Uh, what is socialism to you? <laughs> that is a really good question. I mean, I've been a socialist all my life. Um, I first probably got involved in politics when I was 15 or 16. So that was in the mid 60s. I know you only think I'm a young man, but I am getting on a little bit. <laughs> and um, well, I suppose um, what I tend to think big picture argument, like I always talk about the chain, the human chain that binds us all together, not in a bad way, but like you help me, I help somebody else, they help somebody else. We, we, we look after each other. And I think, to put it very simply, I think that human beings are social animals. I do think it's important that we look after each other. We, you know, we watch each other's back. And society is much better when we are like that. We're much stronger as human beings. It's in our nature. And I don't know, I've read a bit about it, not as much as I should have done, but when uh, human beings first emerged from, you know, wherever we emerged from, uh, obviously we were, first of all, hunter-gatherers. And it seems as though for generations and gener thousands of tens of thousands of years, human beings had to be social to survive. And it's in our DNA, it's who we are. And you couldn't hunt a big animal on your own, you know, or, or later on to cultivate, it was like, so being sociable people, we call it collectivism, don't we? But what we mean is we protect each other's back. So to put it as simply as I can, that's how I see it. Now, obviously, uh, the way in which society is organised under a capitalist society, which we're now living in, aren't we? Well, it's really the law of the jungle. But instead of the law of the jungle mean we look after each other, it's like we all fight each other. That's the idea, which doesn't work very well. So when I, uh, I represent 20, I'm an MP, as you know, I represent 23 mining villages. What's interesting is um, if a cunit is in trouble or someone's got a difficulty, you can bet your life there'll be somebody there to help. Maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, maybe someone went to school with 20, 30 years ago somebody down the street. So during the big crisis of COVID, every single person, I live in a village, in a pit village, who had a difficulty, say get into the shop or whatever, somebody came and helped them. And I'll never forget, um, I'll never forget when I first became the MP, there was a uh, a fire and a little child died in the fire the mother I mean it's awful to talk about these things but there's still people who can't afford to be buried and you know, still have pauper's graves I don't know if everybody's aware of that but it's true that some people they get buried at the cost of the you know the the community tax pays for it but in this particular case the 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 mother she survived couldn't pay for it and somebody came up to me and said I'm going to give you some money and I want you to uh, give it to anonymous donation so that the child can have a proper decent uh, burial, a little child. And it very much touched me and I've, I've always remembered it ever since. But of course, in every day, in every way, there are thousands and thousands of uh, acts of kindness, of solidarity, of community, of you know people looking at, after each other in every street in our country. So I, I often say, well, look, there are two contending value systems you might call it that one is like greed you know uh, I'm for me I don't care about anybody else that's one value system which the Tories try to promote then there's another one and I think this is the real British value and probably beyond, way beyond Britain too but I know I know Yorkshire best I know Britain best so I can speak about that a contending value, which is we look after each other. That's what the NHS does. That's why I say the NHS is a form of, it is a form of socialism. It's not how much you've got in your wallet that decides where you are in the queue. It's how 
you know, severe your illnesses that decides where you are in the queue. I, I believe this is pretty uh, basic human stuff. Um, we can call it any fancy words we like. After I thought about all this as a young man, I then began to read Marx and, and various socialists, William Morris, other people like that. I mean, it goes into a lot of detail, a lot of intellectual detail, and I don't dismiss that. But at the bottom track, bottom line, it's about values. It's how you speak and talk and interact with others. I believe we can build society like that. That would be a socialist society from my point of view. So no doubt some scientific socialists or somebody will be saying, what's well, tricky on about? It's, you know, you should be reading the third volume of Das Capital, chapter two. Sorry, but let's start with where we are. Um, it's one of the real benefits for me of doing all these interviews is I always pick something up and straight away there that the idea of doing something for someone as a transaction like so so like rather than expecting someone to pay you back for a good deed that's circulating yeah. in the community yeah. that that's what's really struck me about yeah. what you've said there this is about like a community building thing is that well, what I see it I see yeah, I think, you know, if you go back to the French Revolution, they have these three slogans, one of which is like liberty, another one's equality, which we believe in, but the other one's called fraternity. Well, we don't say fraternity because that's like sexist pigs sort of thing, but you can talk about community or solidarity. And uh, it's the same idea that we're all one human family, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what the colour of your skin are, what your gender is, your sexuality or anything else. We are all one human family. And I think, yeah, I think that's what I think is the core of where we are now. You know, you can talk about it, you know, when there are strikes on. And it's a long time ago now, uh, but I was very active at the time of the miners' strike. And people did look after each other. Um, they did bond together and they stuck out for the principles, which was a strong community. Now, if you fly forward to today, because the strike, that strike was a long time ago, it's not so long ago now that in Van Oldswick, the engineers came out um, because what was under threat was a part of British engineering being taken off to either Spain or somewhere else. Um, they stuck out for what they believed in and the one they won the out against Rolls Royce, you know, so... Um, it's both the industrial struggle, but it's much more than that. I and mean, in the community communities that I represent, it's often the women that are out there first, you know, doing things in the community. And uh, it's amazing to see in every village I represent, there are groups of people working together for the good of the community, not to make money, not to make themselves look big, powerful people, but just because it's in your blood, it's what you do. Would you say like this is a, a particularly working class thing, um, you know, to see these mm. the, the way the communities work together? Is that a working class thing as far as you're well, concerned? I've always lived in working class communities, so I can't really tell you <laughs> too much about middle class communities. I don't know, but I'm hoping it's part of the human makeup. But... Let me tell you a story, you know, you've got to imagine, you know, you're a little boy, eight years old, you listen to your granddad, he's always banging on about uh, trade unions and labour and socialism and all the rest of it. So you say to your granddad, granddad, you're eight years old, remember, and it, what's all this about the trade unions and this, that and the other, you know, we're talking about granddad, I don't know what it means. So he says to you, right, let's go back, so out, your, out the back of the house, into the garden, and there's a load of old bamboo canes that he's used for propping up tomatoes. And he says, go grab them over there. <coughs> you go grab them. You pick up about a dozen or so. He says, just take one of them in your hands, John, and break them. So you take a bamboo stick and, you, and it cracks and it breaks. So he says, right, now get hold of all them 12 now and do it. So you get hold of the 12. You're holding them tight. You're eight years old. You think you're a big man. You can't break them. You're bending them, you're twisting them. You're, you're. By the way, uh, I'm a lot older than, than eight now. I couldn't break 12 now, I've tried. I tried it not so long ago. It's quite hard to do. So what does it mean, Grandad? I can't be, you know. He says, let me tell you something. That's what socialism is. He says, they can break you if you're on your own, but they'll never break you if you stick 
together. Now, he never told me who they were, but we kind of knew who they were. And I've never forgot it. I've never forgot that story. And it, like some people will be watching today who don't have any kids, never mind grandkids. I want them to remember this story. And when they've got grandkids, tell their, tell their grandkids, we'll pass it on from one generation to the next, because that is what socialism is really about, isn't it? Sticking so together. I'm I'm going out to buy some bamboo yeah, now. To, give it a try for my, it a try. For my son and yeah, daughter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, uh, I suppose you're saying, uh, who were they? So, who were they? Well, in this I think situation? you know. So, <clears throat> here's a another sort of thing. I learned a lot of things when I was young, but you don't know you're learning them. And um, so, I will one of those who went off to school and when I was 15 the head teacher came to see me I mean the school leaving age was 16 but the head teacher he said look he said you're wasting your time at school you might as well get yourself off it were Easter uh, he said you're not going to do out here so go get yourself a job so I left school when I was 15 and um <clears throat> well without really any qualifications really and I felt as if I'd left me, let my mum and dad down because they always said, oh, I, I had a brother and a sister. They always said, ah, John, he reads all books, he's right, clever, he's going to do well. But I, I failed. And I remember, again, this is my granddad. And I went to work with him, he was a plumber. And uh, he says, come on, come on, work with us. So I did. And he says to us, um, he says, I can see you're not happy, what's wrong? I says, well, I don't really know, but he says, I know what it is. He says, you've left, you've left school and you've failed, haven't you? And you feel as if you've failed. I said, yeah. He says, well, the system ain't meant to work for people like us. He said, it don't work that way. But <clears throat> he said, don't forget, people, working class people, we're the real elite, not the ones who think they're at the top. We're the real elite. But we build houses that people live in. We dig coal, we dig, you know or we teach kids or whatever it might be, because it's not only people who work with their hands, but it's also people who work with their brains. We're the real elite. Don't let them defeat you. People like us, we're the best people. And I thought, I, mean, I didn't really absorb it, but I've often thought since I must write a book about people like us, because people like us, the system isn't working for us. And as I sort of developed my understanding, I thought, well, I met some uh, socialists and they told me about class and things like that. And I, I married it all up in my mind and started reading. I eventually went off to university and that type of stuff. But I never forgot it. And <clears throat> so you've got to say, well, the kind of society we live in, I've just described the ethos that I believe should be born, born into. There's another ethos, which is selfishness and greed. There is a class structure to how our country works and how capitalism works, because the system we live on is it under is capitalism. And they, to answer your question, are the ruling class, the people at the top who rule our country. They rule it in their interest, not in the interest of the whole country. And I think, you know, they're the ones who try to break working people by snapping the bamboo stick. It's they, they're the ones, this is a class society. It's not in the way that we usually use the word working class, because often people talk about working class, meaning people who work with their hands, like I did. Because, I, you know, I worked for a lot of years on buildings. <clears throat> it's anybody who works for a living, they, they are the people who work. So, however, yeah, that's what it is. And, um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to say on this subject, which I'd like to come back to if I get a chance on any further questions you've got to ask. Yeah, definitely, and please feel free to, to continue on and, and speak about whatever you like to, because uh, it's so interesting, and I love your stories as well. The great analogies, and I, I think that's a really important way to, yeah. um, to speak to people as well, isn't it? Because people can relate to that. Um, so I was... I was wondering as well, you were talking there about like what defines a working class person, really. Do you think the term key worker 
has sort of should be helpful oh. to people, given that yeah. these were the people who had to go to work yeah. during the pandemic. The country would have ground her a halt without. Well, them. I think um, I do think uh, that. Though I think most people are key workers, but whatever profession you're in, um, you know. I mean, look, when I was working on building sites, we used to hate architects because we always used to think, "What are they doing? Just making life difficult." And um, but architects are key workers too, but they can work from home. Because, uh, you know, they're manipulating data on a screen and so on and so forth. The key workers, I think, under the pandemic were people who were, had to go to work uh, to keep the country going. Now, what's clear about them is mainly they were low paid. Mainly they were in humdrum jobs. I'm, not, I'm checking out the NHS for a minute out of it, but we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so lorry drivers, uh, bus drivers, train drivers, uh, people who worked at Tesco's or down at Co-op, where we've got a co-op in our village. Um, you know, all of those kind of people, the cleaners, uh, the people who went into care homes to look after people, they're the ones who kept this country going. And then you've got the NHS, uh, who obviously were there, and then the other, uh, the police and the uh, the. Uh, the you know, the fire service and so on and so forth. They are the ones who kept this country going. And there was another group, by the way, who couldn't go to work uh, for other reasons, and they couldn't work from home either. And they were put on furlough, what they call furlough. Now, what I think is striking is who, uh, the key workers were the billionaires. We're going to come to them in a minute or two. It wasn't the millionaires. It was the people who were on low pay, who've now who've been told by the blooming Tories that they're now on a pay freeze. Uh, the nurses have been given one percent increase every year. I think is on, on a pay freeze. But however, uh, because inflation's going up, taxes going up, and all the rest of it, even the nurses are having a pay cut. So, <clears throat> what's interesting is if you get a list of the professions of people who died. It's terrifying and it's upsetting to know that anybody died, but they died because they were at work. So I'm talking about people who were at work who then got COVID and died from it. It's the manual workers, uh, people who work in shops, drivers, obviously nurses, care workers, doctors, the key workers. When you come to the professionals, uh, the manager, manage the management class, very few of them, and the figures are there for anybody to see if they want to challenge, very few of them died. But they worked from home. And um, it's a shocking indictment of the nature of our society uh, that we're not paying, paying those people more money, and yet the whole society rested on that class of people. But I wouldn't say they're the only people who I'd regard as working class. But the thing is, um, the people who worked from home, by the way, geographic, we're going to talk about north and other parts of the country. Um, if you look carefully, you'll find a large proportion of people living in parts of the southeast where there's a higher propensity of people to have top jobs work from home. In the north and in other parts of the country, large proportion, almost the same, two thirds, like, were having to work from work. And working from work, you were then exposed to risk. And then more people uh, died from it. Uh, obviously, we're on low pay and all the other stuff. So it's pretty shocking. I think they then, by the way, altogether, at one time or another, over 11 million people were put on furlough, which means you're living on 80% of your income. And you're struggling already because your pay is low. It's even lower when you've got 11 million. Unemployment's increased. All the other things. So we've got a society, we've got an economy that doesn't work um, for the people who work. It, it, it's as blunt as that. It doesn't work for the people who work. They've, they've died, they've been paid low pay, you know, and uh, been exposed to risk. People have been left at home, shut at home unable to get to work because of furlough and you've had mental health problems. You know, it's, it's like a vision of society, but much more concentrated <clears throat> because of the, what happened in the pandemic 
than the normal society, the normal society, because we all go about doing our own business. But look, here's the thing that gets my go, which I'm gonna let I'm gonna hope you're gonna let me talk about for a minute or two. Whilst people were getting COVID, whilst people were looking after others, whilst the strength of the community was strong, powerful sense of community, whilst people were working to keep the country going, what were the rich doing? The rich, and I'm not talking about like footballers <laughs> who were gone a good screw, but they're doing quite well. I'm on about the very rich, the super rich, the ruling class. And what uh, is quite alarming, the figures have just come out during lockdown, the billionaires it massively increased the wealth. The figures have only just come out, but the richest 250 people, 250 in our country, <coughs> excuse me, increased their wealth during the COVID by 106 billion pounds. That's not what they're worth. That's what they've increased the value by in a year. 106 billion pounds. Now, it's 250 of them, so it's easy to work out. It's roughly, it works out at roughly 420 or 30 million pounds a piece. That's, the, that's what they've earned in a year in the growth of wealth. They were already rich. The wealth's grown by roughly 420 million pounds a piece. <clears throat> that's, that's more, and they're spending 65 days in a year. There's 420 million. So they're earning more than a million pounds a day in the growth in wealth. <clears throat> Whilst, like I've just described, you know, people at the Tesco's or at Co-op or whatever, bear in mind, 30 million people in the country work, 30 million people, roughly a bit more, work for a living. So we're talking about the richest 20, 250 or so. Now, the average wage, let's say it's 30,000 pounds a year for working people is round about that depends on how you measure the average. It would take 15,000 years for you to earn what these people have earned in uh, under a year during COVID. Now, human civilization is arguable, but agriculture started 8,000 years ago. We kind of started to, in China and in, uh, in two or three other locations as well, including in the Americas, actually. But uh, so human beings have been cultivating the planet for 8,000 years. But it would take you twice as long as that, at £30,000 a year, to get to where uh, they got to in a single year. Now, people might say, well, you know, OK, it's not good, is it? My point is this, that if you study socialism, you know, the, the people who created socialism who analyzed it and showed us how it works. The wealth which these people have increased by during COVID, where did it come from? It came from the rest of us, the 30 million people who work. That's where it came from because their wealth's, their, uh, their wealth's gone down mm -hmm. and uh, their income's gone down. Now, roughly speaking, and I've worked their figures out, by the way, since the financial crash, mm -hmm. the 33 million people who work for a living, it's around 33 million, they've lost about 400 billion pounds in wages because the wages didn't go up, whereas inflation did. So we reckon they've lost about 430 billion pounds in spending power. And the richest few handful of people, a few hundred people at the most, benefited. So you've had a direct transfer from, from working people into the richest. Now, it's important we understand this. Because when we talked about they, who are they are, who are they? <clears throat> they aren't just like somebody who's a bit talented, like the Beatles or you know, whoever it might be. <laughs> a footballer or something like that. They are talking about the, the people who own the means of production, what with capital, wealth, the land. People who own the land or buildings. Uh, it's not just super talented people like Bill Gates, whether he's talented or not, I have no idea. We're talking about the people, the wealthiest people in our society. 
And we call it exploitation, the exploiting the rest of the, the country. Now, if you think about it, you know, go back to what I said at the beginning, the chain of human, the chain of kind of, 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 of a mutual aid. They aren't, they aren't helping anybody. They're helping themselves. It's the rest of the people who have to look after each other. It's a completely different, um, what you call like a ethos, a different ethical system, which exists for the rich. And, you know, here's a funny thing. During COVID, yeah, a, you can look at the number of people who are billionaires out of pharmaceuticals, in other words, making medicine. And they've increased the wealth by two and a half billion pounds Humanity's, fight, humanity's fighting a virus which is, could destroy humanity. And the people who own the pharmaceutical industry have increased the wealth by 2.5 billion. That is not what I call socialism, by the way. I, that is, I'm not going to help you, I'm going to help myself. And, and uh, it's wrong. Mm. It's wrong, and it's based on that system. So why am I a socialist? You know, to come back to your original question, because I look at the way society and our economy is organised, and I get, I get, I get knocked. I get very, very annoyed with it, and it's time to put an end to that kind of system. One, I'm going to. I've given you lots of figures. I'm just going to give you one more, then I'll shut up about figures. But like the stock exchange, people probably don't think about the stock exchange too much, but I do. And the reason why is because I'm a sad, sad individual. But apart from that, um, the stock, the, so the companies which are valued on the London Stock Exchange, right? Um, when the crash happened, which was 12 years, 12 or 13 years ago, those companies were worth 2.6 trillion pounds, which is a hell of a lot of money. 2.6 trillion. Now, whilst we all had austerity, Whilst we all had our cutbacks, whilst wages and salaries were being held down, and then whilst COVID was happening, the value of the London Stock Exchange increased by one, almost 1 1.3 trillion pounds. So in spite of the, you might call it misfortune of the crash, all the years of the cuts to the NHS, to education, to the school teachers, to the parks department, uh, and every other aspect of our social life was being cut and our wages were being held back. The big companies were increasing the value by 1.3 trillion pounds and the billionaires, as I've just described, were earning all that money. Now, that is a society that's got its priorities in the wrong order. And I believe it's time to talk about taxing wealth because we haven't talked about that as socialists for many, for donkey's years, but we should, because it's wealth which is the source of the problem, in my opinion. I'll show up now. That's, uh, no, absolutely brilliant. And those figures are absolutely staggering, aren't they? And, and and what we've what we're told really is that uh, the capitalist system will trickle down and benefit everyone else. We've been told that for years and years. But what we can see is even the investment that's yeah. gone in through furlough and all those things has actually gone yeah. to the top. That's what we're that's we're seeing direct evidence of that now, aren't we? No, it don't um, trickle down. I mean, how can anybody in the right mind? I know that the Tories say it, but I'm not sure if they're all in the right mind sometimes. But I mean, here's the evidence, you know. Whilst the incomes of working people, roughly it's £1,300 per um, worker in lost income, which you can multiply by 30 odd million workers and you, you get to like, you know, 400 odd billion pounds. That money was lost. The richest were getting richer and richer and richer, like I've just described. So that's not money trickling down. That's money being funneled up through the Tory years. And uh, I think we've got to get this message over because many people, uh, they might have heard of socialism, possibly most people might not have done. But for example, Labour hasn't done very well recently in persuading people to vote for Labour and it's meant to be a centre left or a left wing party. Um, I think, you know, we've got to get the message out. This is a society which is, it's got its, 
you know, his priorities are all wrong. I don't believe it represents the values of the British people from what I've seen. And remember, you know, I've been an elected member since 1984 because I was a councillor before I became an MP. I was elected in the middle of the miners' strike. All my life, I've seen people reaching out and helping others. I believe that those are the central values, the central ethic of, of, uh, of the British and probably all of the nations too, as far as I know, human, human beings are all broadly the same. So, uh, yeah, we've got a system that works the opposite and it's got to be changed. So that what makes me a socialist, you know. So in, um, in amongst all that as well, there's so much interesting stuff you said there and I, and I had to comment on the, the trickle yeah. down theory and the trickle up theory. But you mentioned something that maybe settled into people's brains a little bit now. You mentioned a wealth tax, which is something that um, hasn't been necessarily spoken about a lot. It's spoken about in the left wing circle. So um, we love a good solution on socialist think tank. That's what we're after. We're accused of being a talking shop on the left, aren't we? But you actually do often propose yeah. real concrete solutions. So could you describe what you mean by a wealth tax and why it is so I've got necessary. some more figures for you because I was hoping you can ask me that question, but I can assure the audience we didn't set it up beforehand. But uh, <laughs> I was hoping to, to I don't like giving too many too many figures, but in a way I love figures because it illustrates everything you want to see. But look, the amount of wealth in our country is enormous. We, we live in, the say we're the fifth or sixth the wealthiest country in the world. But the question is, where is the wealth? Where is it? because most people I know don't have a huge amount of wealth to access. So, um, you know, but I've never seen a man in a Rolls Royce driving around the pit villages I represent throwing tens of pounds out or hundreds of pounds out to, to let it trickle out of his back of his Rolls Royce, by the way. But, um, and not such people don't exist. <clears throat> However, we've done some calculations today. So these are the figures, you know, uh, in spring 2021, um, well, if spring ever comes, because it's bloody perishing at the moment. But anyway, if and does it? Let's just be clear. Most of the left have argued for generations about taxing income. So you know, you pay income tax and so on and so forth. Um, for some reason, we haven't really talked about taxing wealth. Wealth is different to income. We, let's be clear in our minds uh, about it. So uh, if your house that you're living in goes up in value, it's not your income, it's your wealth. Your income is what your salary is or your wages, however you're paid, you know. So we've got to be careful how we express it. <clears throat> now, I'm not interested, and I don't think the left should be interested in taxing people's houses. You know, with, there's already the council tax, which is based on your value of your house. Um, but a wealth tax should tackle wealth, real wealth. And so I want to be careful what I say, because if the Daily Mail or the Telegraph watch what we're saying now, they're going to write a story that I'm in favour of taxing people's gardens. So let's be clear. Uh, we're not talking about taxing people's, uh, you know, where they live. Um, but we're talking about real wealth now. So I've been very, very cautious. And I've asked the question, if we were to tax any wealth outside of people's homes above two million quid, which is a lot of money, but, but let's, you know, let's be cautious. And we were to say, you'll tax, we'll, we'll tax every year a half a percent of your wealth above two million pounds, provided it's not your house. Now, I don't know many, how many people live in two million pound houses, but let's, let's say that we don't want to fall out with him. Uh, so we're talking about, if you've got wealth of more, two million pounds, more than two million pounds, we're going to tax it half a percent, which is bugger all, isn't it? It produces uh, eight point seven billion pounds a year, right? Now, uh, because I've been wanting to give a rise to, um, I've been wanting to give a rise to the NHS for quite a while. I know that a 5% rise, I think it is, for every single person in the NHS. Remember, it's the largest employer in the whole of Europe. It's a big firm, the NHS. It will cost 5 billion. So a half percent tax on wealth above 2 million, pa 2 billion, 2 million pounds will produce 8.7 billion pounds, enough to pay every single person who works in the NHS a proper, a proper rise, which is what they're entitled to. 
if you were to say we want to uh, say sell the two million threshold, but we want to charge them one percent a year, it produces nearly seventeen billion pounds a year. Think about it. So uh, you could do a lot with that kind of money. You know, to, you know, I'm a Yorkshire. I don't like particularly spending money unless it's done properly. So I'm not, I'm not about throwing money around, but I think you could begin to transform our society. And the, the truth of the matter is that it's not the differences in income where the power lies. It's the differences in wealth. If you own a factory or you own an office or you own a business, and it's a large business, your wealth uh, increases as a consequence of the fact that you own that. Then if you choose not to pay the workers very much, your wealth increases even more. And we know that that's, what, that's what's going on. So, I mean, I noticed uh, that in the, um, the, the last year alone, this is in the middle of COVID, the shareholders uh, on the London Stock Exchange got dividends worth, I think it was 66 billion pounds in a year. 66 billion pounds in a year. So wealth is, wealth of that kind, capital is power. It's power over working people. Wealth equals power. Yet for some reason, the left has not dared to talk about taxing capital, not properly. And I, and I think we should. So I'm going to start talking about this. I've been talking about it for a while, actually, but I'm going to talk about it more. It raises large amounts of money. I mean, you might say, well, you're a bit feeble, John. You only want it half a percent. <laughs> you only want it half a percent. But, um, you know, it's done elsewhere, by the way. Norway does it. The Spain, in Spain, they've got it. They've even got it in Switzerland. But we don't tax wealth. We, and it's a bit odd. Now, the other thing is, is unearned income. So there's a lot to talk about, but we're just trying to tackle one or two issues here just to get it across to anybody who happens to watch. So I've talked about wealth. I've talked about income. But some people gain income from owning wealth. They don't earn it. So, for example, you might get a duke who inherited £9 billion worth of land. <laughs> called the Duke of Westminster, but I'm not sure if I got the figure right, so we won't, we won't name him. <laughs> um, he didn't pay tax on it because it's all in a, in a blooming, uh, it's all in, you know, various different devices to avoid paying tax when he knows it. And I, and I, you know, he lost his dad, so, you know, you don't want to make politics out of somebody losing his dad, but his dad left all that money. Now, um, is he really earning the money that he's getting? I mean, I, I think... Um, you know, I noticed that there was tens of millions of pounds being paid to the family trust for that particular dukedom uh, last year. Um, can you really say that they're earning it? It's more like unearned income. But here's the really weird thing in Britain. Why would you charge less tax on unearned income than you do on earned income? But that is what we do. We, we charge less tax. So, for example, if you get dividend, you've got share. Let's say you've got a million pounds in shares. And you're drawing an income from the dividends that's paid on the shares. <clears throat> you pay less tax than you do on income tax. Why? Why? I don't get it. But that just seems to be the case. We don't, we don't tax uh, uh, unearned income the same as we tax earned income. So everywhere you look at it, the system is kind of... You know, it's the, so I used to say it's rigged. The system's rigged. It's rigged against working people. And I often think, well, you know, you, you tax people who are on a, on a good income to distribute that money down to the people in poverty, but you don't touch wealth and you tax unearned income less than you tax earned income. Now, I don't think any of this is right. And I feel as if the Labour left and the left more generally, the socialist left, because not by any means uh, would I say that every socialist is in the Labour Party, not at all, uh, needs to have a debate. We need to have a debate about all this because why has it happened that we haven't contested this stuff? Really, I uh, remember I got involved in politics in 1966 or so. I don't believe, you know, and I've been in, engaged at every stage 
I don't remember any really major debate about these issues, not properly, in all those years. And so I think the left needs to think about all this. And there will be arguments against the wealth tax. There'll be arguments against um, unearned income uh, being taxed at the same level. But whoever's going to make that argument, let them make it. Let's have an honest debate. Let's get it out there. Let's have a discussion. Do we live in a class society? I believe we do. If somebody says it, we don't. Well, come on, let's debate it. And should we uh, be allowing that power to continue in making money while people are, are ill? I, you know, now... I've got the figures I've given you off of the Sunday Times Rich List. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to quote the bloke, who, the bloke who wrote it, because this is the man who writes about the richest people in Britain. And this is what he said. He said, in the Sunday Times, I mean, Murdoch, but he said, there are many readers who will feel uncomfortable that such astonishing fortunes have been created as Britain battled the virus which has claimed 128,000 lives, increased unemployment to 1.7 million, ramped up government debt, clipped civil liberties, and heightened levels of depression and other mental illnesses. So they're a bit embarrassed. They're a bit embarrassed. Usually they say what the richest thousand are, but this year they've only said the richest 250. So we don't really know what the other 750 have been up to, but we can guess, and we, we do know to an extent. They feel uncomfortable. I don't feel uncomfortable, I feel angry. Because when I look at, you know, Auntie Mavis up at the co-op, taking risks every day, you know, because she wants to keep the, you know, the, she's asked to earn the money and she wants to look after the village, or, you know, Mr. Smith down the road who's looking after the pension and lives in the opposite street. I, 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 think, I think of them and, I don't feel uncomfortable when this amount of richness comes out of the, of the Sunday Times. I feel angry. And we've got to get this message over because I think we can win the argument, but we've got to get it out there. We've got to have the courage of our convictions. I think the argument as well as everything you've alluded to there, it's like work doesn't pay, not the way it should. No. Like work working hard doesn't necessarily guarantee you that. And I think is it yeah. I, I think there is some statistics somewhere that the that the greatest predictor of um, even earnings over a lifetime are how rich your parents yeah. are when you were born. And you're much more likely to earn yeah. whether you whether it's unearned money yeah. and it's been lumped in with earned money and stuff. So like if people are making this kind of money, what would be wrong with taxing people even more than that? So if they if they're increasing their wealth by like five, six percent in a year or, or this year, yeah. it's what it's a it's a much bigger percentage this year, isn't it? Yeah. Well uh, I think you know, what, what I feel about it, there needs to be a debate. Now, the argument back probably will be, well, if you're going to tax them, they'll all bugger off to, you know, Hong Kong or <laughs> where Singapore or Switzerland or wherever like that. And, um, you know, they won't invest in British industry. But let me just tell you, they're not investing anyway. There's a kind of investment strike on, you know, in a way, the capitalists... They're not investing in, in, in our core industries. I just mentioned earlier about Rolls-Royce. I mean, Rolls-Royce Barn Oldswick was built there for a reason. It was because they were helping to uh, build the armaments industry to fight fascism. And it was out of reach of the German bombers. So it was built there as part of the war effort to beat Nazism. And then after the war, those brilliant engineers then helped to develop the jet engine. And of course, Rolls-Royce is a, is an, is a skills, uh, engineering skills par excellence. Now, <clears throat> that quality of engineering, uh, Britain helped to create you know, on a world level. There's still you know, world-skilled uh, engineers uh, in Britain and at Van Oldswick. Rolls-Royce wanted to close it and they were going to move it off to somewhere else because it was cheaper they couldn't get you know cheaper there was a big strike and they, as I say that they, they won it but so I think you know there's a lot that's wrong with our country but it's the people at the top the top are making decisions about how to enhance their wealth without thinking about the social uh, um, implications and I feel that uh you know, I feel that we've got to 
draw it out because they're the ones who are lecturing us about patriotism. You read the papers and oh, the left are patriots and and, and the, 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 you know this that and the other. Well, the left are internationalists. We 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 do believe internationalism, but I don't think running down the British engineering industry so that we couldn't blooming build ventilators to give oxygen to people suffering was very patriotic. But that's what British capitalism had done. And as you know, they then paid Dyson quite a lot of money to try to de develop it quickly. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ways of looking at this, but in the end, it's the left arguments, which are the strongest, uh, in my opinion, and the common sense. So I grew up really, I grew up in quite a, you know, in a poor background. Like I said, I left school when I was 15. I did get to university. But most of my experience, working experience was working on building sites and that kind of stuff. I feel that it's the common sense. It's common sense. This is not difficult. Sometimes the left makes it more difficult um, because um, I don't know why. I don't know. But if you're speaking, speak ordinary, like I speak Yorkshire. If you speak Yorkshire, you speak plain and you tell it as it is and how you've found it then, uh, you know, you're in a decent uh, place, I think, to win the argument. Now, one last figure, because I've given you a lot, but I'm going to test your memory in a minute. <laughs> no, I'm not. But um, the, we took a look. I, 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 we took a look at the richest companies in Britain. And we asked, because they're not investing. I, I, that's the point. They're not investing. You need to invest to develop the skills and to make sure that you're still productive and you can pay decent wages. What we discovered is there's nearly, uh, it's, it's 909 billion pounds, 909 billion pounds in the banks, liquid assets, liquidity, unspent money amongst the top companies. Uh, it was it was bad enough. It was it was three hundred billion in two thousand and six. It's now nearly a trillion, not far for a trillion pound in unspent money. Now they're sitting on they're sitting on a lot of dosh. I mean, if we're to say we're going to tax it, unless you spend it and get invested and create jobs in the UK, what they're doing is trying to take jobs abroad. So, you know, I think you know, when and I, I just maybe one final point on all this is like when I learned about socialism i learned a lot from my granddad and then i met other people and they they schooled me i bought i studied economics and i never studied it formally but i did a lot of reading i went to classes with marxists with socialists and that kind of stuff we don't talk enough about economics on the left nowadays i don't know why we're more interested in like identity stuff all of which is important you know you know gender or race sexuality and all those are really important but economics is one of the central disciplines that we should try to learn. And that's why I've done, gone through a lot of figures with you now, but to try to show how society works, a capitalist society works like in Britain today. That's absolutely uh, brilliant, John, and I totally agree. It's essential that we talk about these things. I often think so. I'm a maths teacher myself. And right. I often think that I often think people don't understand these big numbers because they're inhuman. Yeah. The, you, you you can't understand numbers once they get over a certain yeah. amount. Like you might know, you might you might have seen forty thousand people at a yeah, football yeah, yeah, stadium, yeah. but you don't know what like sixty five million people in a country yeah. looks like. You can't yeah. fathom it, and it's the same with money as well. Um, so I do think we need to understand these mechanisms. We do, we do. So that you've that, that yeah, you've for example, uh, roughly three hundred thousand years ago was the start of Homo sapiens, but nobody knows exactly. But anyway, 300,000 years ago, it's a good, a good time as any, probably a little bit more than that. So through the whole of humanity, and during that time, they called it encephalization. The way our brains began to form was still developing 300,000 years. Just to make the figure so we understand it, if you earn 30,000 a year on the average, it's the average pay for a Britain, it would take 300,000 years for you to get to 10 billion pounds and that is not a large amount of money now for these billionaires uh have a look at the rich list because you can find it online have a look and think about that for the whole of the history of the biological history of humanity is what it would take 
uh, for you to earn at £30,000 a year. You work every year, all that time, to get to £10 billion. So, yeah, I agree we're going to find ways of kind of getting these numbers to make sense to people um, in order for people to understand it. Um, it's not easy, this, but I don't think it's impossible. But first of all, you've got to have a leadership of the labour movement and of social and socialists who are prepared to take on the argument and make, make the case. And that's why I was very pleased to be invited to come along to your think tank, because um, I think I know that you're about, in, you know, about developing ideas, discussing things, trying to find ways that we can express it in, in meaningful kind of language that people can get a grip on. I mean, I'll try to explain my philosophy as best as I can to you. I think you've done an excellent job of that, John, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, do you have any final words um, for any of well, our uh, viewers? Well, what I'd listeners? say is this really is, I think, I don't know how long this is going to be online, but it might be online for a long time. I hope it is. Um, although why would anybody want to listen to me? But anyway, the thing what I'd say is, you know, we're going through dark times at the moment on the left. And because uh, we've seen uh, the defeat of the left at the general election when Jeremy Corbyn uh, wasn't able to make further advance on 2017, uh, the 2019 election. And then we've seen the changes in the Labour movement since. But what I feel, and I've been around a long time now, and I've looked at history, I've talked to the old timers when I first... I first got into politics. So I was speaking to people who were my age in 1966. So they would have been born in the 1890s. And uh, I knew people who'd uh, been implementing the poor law before even the proper national insurance system had come into existence. And what I'd say is really through that whole of that period, I call it a red thread. There's been a red thread, you know, continuous presence of socialists. Sometimes that thread was just down to a single, single thread. And if you'd have pulled much out, it might have snapped, but it never did throughout the whole of British history. And you can go back a lot further than, than I can. And that thread's still there. Now, sometimes that thread becomes quite a rich red tapestry, quite wide, like a big river. Sometimes it's come, it narrows down, but it's never died away. And what I feel is, my final thought is this, people who walk away because we've been defeated at a national level, you're walking away from the terrain of battle and don't do it, get back in, get stuck in because don't break the thread, don't allow it to snap. And, you know, I've said before, you know, if the, if the suffragettes, they ended up in prison, they were on hunger strike, if they said, oh, we've been beaten, <laughs> women might never have got the vote. And if the, you know, the people who follow the toll martyrs and uh, said, well, it's just too much, we've been, some of them, you know, the, the chartists or the levelers who were hung at Burford Church, you, you don't walk away from the battle because it's never lost. It's never lost. You can still come back. So, yeah, these are dark days. People think we're being defeated. And I, I know I've read people on the do Twitter and all this stuff nowadays. Oh, it's too much for me. It's too hard. Get lost. It's not too hard. I've been at it all my life, you know. And I'm optimistic. I believe in the future. I'm hopeful. So, I've, you know, if I want to say anything to anybody, it's, you know, if it's on my dying breath almost, I'll say, you know, the struggle continues. Don't give up. We can win this. Thank you so much, John. And I want to, as well as on behalf of all our viewers and everything, I'd like to thank you for Absolutely. always keeping that, the the red flag flying and, you know, the in the face of a lot of adversity. So um, we really Thanks. do appreciate it. And good luck it. to you. We'll keep the red flag flying here.